Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Olumide Macaulay. Hello and welcome. Tonight, President Muhammadu Buhari endorses APC candidate Pastor Osage Zeyamu ahead of the Edo governorship election. Governor Basaki rejects purported takeover of Edo State House of Assembly as market women rally support for his re-election. Worship centers reopen in Lagos as Muslims observe Friday Jumat prayers after five months of lockdown. And at least 16 persons confirmed killed as the Air India Express plane crash lands at an airport in the southern state of Kerala. Plus business and news from Abuja, the FCT, and later from our studios in London. On business news tonight, President Mohamedou Buhari signs amended Companies and Allied Matters Bill 2020 into law 30 years after its first enactment. On sports news tonight, Federal Ministry of Sports confirmed the resumption of non-contact sports insist on compliance with COVID-19 safety protocols. All eyes are still on next month's governorship election in Edo State with more reactions trailing the political situation there. The latest is coming from the United States mission in Nigeria, which says it's disappointed with happenings and actions of those it describes as political actors. The U.S. mission said in a statement on its official Twitter handle that it's concerned over allegations of interference by security agencies. The statement reads in part, as we approach the 2020 off-cycle elections in Edo and Ondo, we urge all stakeholders to work towards a free, fair, transparent and peaceful process. We encourage all stakeholders, including INEC, political parties and the security services to continue to improve the electoral process. The U.S. mission says it looks to Nigeria as an important leader on the African continent and as a democratic partner of Nigeria, the United States remains committed to working together to achieve mutual goals of peace and prosperity for the citizens of both countries. Now, the U.S. mission is not the only one concerned about the political situation in Edo State. The Inter-Party Advisory Council, IPAC, is also calling on President Muhammadu Buhari to ensure that there is no breakdown of law and order in the state ahead of the election. The national chairman of the council, Dr. Leonard Zenwa, condemns the political crisis rocking the state insisting that it will only that it will not sit idly by and allow the all progressives congress and the people's democratic party scuttle the election to the detriment of 12 other political parties whose candidates are fully prepared so the inter-party adversary council ipac strongly condemns the unfolding political upheavals and rascality in those states it is a dangerous misstep that can throw the entire country into a major crisis. The Council urges our colleagues to restrain themselves and play by the rule and the electoral guidelines. The nation cannot afford the political crisis in the states, buffeted by insecurity and their economic hardship visited on the people in an unending circle of lockdown. The Council calls on all stakeholders to ensure that all hands will be on deck for the Edo and own the polls to hold successfully in scheduled dates as this nation cannot afford postponement or suspension on account of incivility or political actors in the states. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari has endorsed Pastor Sage Zeyamu as the governorship candidate of the APC for the Edo governorship election. Ms. Zeyamu was led to the meeting by the chairman of the party's caretaker and convention planning committee. Mr. Meimala Buni, who is also the governor of Le Yobe State. At the end of the meeting, Mr. Yamu spoke with House Correspondents, State House Correspondents, where he also commented on the removal of the roof in the State House of Assembly. Our House Correspondent, Kayla Megua, reports. 
as the ruling All Progressives Congress prepares to kick off its campaign into the Edo State Governorship race. The chairman of the party's caretaker committee, along with other progressive governors, officially present the candidate of the party for the endorsement of President Muhammad Buhari. It has been a contentious race filled with intrigues, considering the history of the parties involved. One being the former national chairman of the party, Mr. Adams Oshomele. His constant presence at the campaigns has provided ammunition for the opposition to discredit the credibility of the APC candidate. The APC members in the Edo State House of Assembly have risen from 14 to 17, leaving the governor with just seven members in the House. Mr. Iyamu is confident that this will solidify his victory regardless of what he describes as the antics of Governor Godwin Obaseki. The governor of Edo and the deputy took over the House of Assembly and vandalized the place. They said that they are renovating it. Ask them. The budget that they passed, including the revised one, is there a provision for, the, for renovation of the House of Assembly? There's none. So if there's no such provision, how can you begin to remove the roof during rainy season? if not because you have sinister motive. So that would tell you that all they were trying to do was to truncate the legislative arm and stop them from sitting. There have been whispers in some quarters claiming not all the APC governors support the candidacy of Pastor Iyamu. The, the Kebbi State Committee Governor says this is false. The question has been asked whether all APC governors are in full support of our candidate and the simple answer is yes. It's laughable to suggest otherwise. Another challenge the party might face during the elections is the power of incumbency, a challenge the Kano State Governor says is easily surmountable. That 14 legislators representing 60% of the population, all their constituency are unhappy that their legis elected legislators were not given the chance to participate in the legislation of that state. And in fact, all the legislation that took place should be considered as illegal. So we are ready to fight somebody who has failed and is an adventure to us. In a statement after the visit, President Buhari charges party leaders to avoid the pitfalls that affected the ruling party's victory in Rivers, Adamawa, and Bayelsa states in the 2019 elections. Kayla Megwa, Channels Television News. Staying with the Edo Assembly crisis, the situation at the Edo State House of Assembly entered its second day today, with officers of the Nigeria Police Force keeping watch at the complex to forestall any breakdown of law and order. Although the complex has been shut, some women and youth who have been positioned themselves in the front of the complex earlier today pledged their support for the state governor. Our correspondent, Jessica Olobuse, Reports. Punctured ceilings revealing the skies above the hallowed chamber of the Edo State House of Assembly in Benin City, the Edo State Capital. The empty chamber and disarranged chairs are the result of what has been described as the early stages of remodeling efforts of the house's complex. The official photograph of the house's allegedly impeached speaker, Francis Okeye, adorns the wall still. The roofing sheets removed from the building are piled on the side of the building, just as the granite placed in front of the entrance a day before remains. It's not quiet outside the House of Assembly complex, however. Some young persons mill around as security operatives stand by. A group of market women is also assembled here, clearly in high spirits. Their support is for Governor Godwin Obaseki. They say quick traditional prayers to the ancestors. Another group of women also arrives at the Edo State House of Assembly. For them, Honorable Francis Okie remains the Speaker of the House. Where all those people say they go to yesterday, 
The different visits to the House indicate clearly that one spin-off from the Edo State House of Assembly crisis is people speaking out about their stands, a feature likely to continue as September 19 approaches. Jessica Olubusea, Channels Television News. And the lockdown of the Assembly is still a concern for the All Progressives Congress, APC, and the parties accusing Governor Godwin Obasiki of hijacking the leadership of the Edo Assembly in contravention of the doctrine of separation of powers. The Vice Chairman of the Media Committee of the APC National Campaign Council for Edo Governorship Election, Honorable Patrick Obayagbon, says the actions of the Governor amounted to an affront to the nation's constitution and should not be tolerated. Where the people of Edo State and indeed the entire world bore witness to these monstrous atrocities and reports in shame, the outgoing governor, Mr. Gordon Obaseki, paraded himself before cameras and microphones, offering a defense of his grotesque mathematics and understanding of democracy, which holds that seven persons are greater than 17. Can seven be indeed greater than 17? The answer, of course, is an emphatic no. Godwin of, Godwin of Baseki is clearly the aggressor in this plot. The one man who has refused the reign of peace, who has remained standing in the way of justice and fairness, who has put his knees on the neck of our democracy in Edo State. As the trajectory of the election reveals that the odds are against him, one may not wonder what he stands to gain from these anti-democratic practices of jackboot democracy. However, whatever the case may be, the wise cancer should be that Godun Obaseki gets off the way of the majority, should stay clear of the people's will, and let the general will of the people prevail. The legislative arm is a co-equal branch of government with a constitutionally protected independence from external interference or pressure under the principles of separation of powers. Meanwhile, some PDP lawmakers in the State House of Assembly want the Inspector General of Police and the DSS to arrest the 17 lawmakers of the House of Assembly for allegedly defined court orders with the purported impeachment of the Speaker. They're also asking INEC to retrieve certificates of return given to the APC lawmakers and award it to them as runners-up in the 2019 Edo State Assembly elections or organize fresh elections on September the 19th alongside the governorship election. We call on the IGP Inspector General of Police and the DSS, Director of State Security Service, to check this shameful action in order to stem the tide of anarchy if this unfortunate and shameful act is left unchecked by not arresting and prosecuting the perpetrators as their sponsors, it will spell doom for democracy. And for those who cease and, and constituencies have been declared vacant for their refusal to subscribe to the oath of office and allegiance, we hereby use this medium to further make the following demand. One, that INEC should formally withdraw their certificates of return. Two, issue same to candidates who are made as the first runner up in the said election. Three, alternatively, alternatively, a fresh election should be fixed along with the September 19, 2020 gubernatorial election in order to save the states from limited resources. In part two after the break, worship centers reopen in Lagos as Muslims observe Friday Jumat prayers after five months of lockdown. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. President Muhammadu Buhari endorses APC candidate Pastor Osage Zeyamu ahead of Edo governorship election. Governor Godwin Obaseke rejects purported takeover of Edo State House of Assembly as market women rally support for his re-election. Worship centers reopen in Lagos as Muslims observe Friday Jumat prayers after five months of lockdown. And at least 16 persons confirmed killed as Air India Express plane crash lands at an airport in the southern state of Kerala. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories than others. Please subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku. Muslims in Lagos today observe the weekly Jamaat prayers in mosques following the reopening of worship centers in the state after more than four months of closure. The state government had suspended any form of crowd and gathering of people in worship centers as a measure to control the spread of coronavirus. The suspension of the order, allowing for 50% capacity, also came as a relief to the Muslim faithful. The Lagos Secretariat Mosque comes alive again with activities after more than four months of silence. With worship centers now given the nod to hold gatherings, Muslim faithful gather for the Friday congregational prayer with strict observance to prescribe protocols. <laughs> The mosque could only accommodate about 500 people against the full capacity of more than 2,000 worshippers. Observing prayers together with other faithful is a great feeling for this worshipper. Well, alhamdulillah, today being the first Jumat after the lockdown, I am so happy to be one of those that pray today. Clerics and worshippers are also positive about this development and seem to have already adjusted to the new norm. If we are, we are able to comply very well on this uh, Jumat, Definitely, that can, uh, that can work for us to, to open other level of prayers. Islam also understands the need for us to be healthy and the need for us to be alive. So any protocol that, uh, that guarantees uh, physical well-being and then uh, keeps us alive will be, uh, should be adhered to, and that is the Islam. Earlier, churches and mosques were disinfected ahead of the reopening of worship centers. The local authorities doing this to complement the effort of the Lagos state government in ensuring that places of worship are safe. We are just doing the icing on the cake, which is also living up to our responsibility as representatives to sanitize, decontaminate, fumigate, churches and mosques. With this we concentrate on uh, mostly the doors, the chairs, you know, you know, the certain areas, the chairs where uh, you have a lot of human, I mean, hand contact. For now, the Lagos State Government says regular gatherings will be permitted to hold in the worship centers, vigils and other services are on hold for now. The state government also advised that senior citizens aged 65 years and above should not attend these places of worship. And 331 more Nigerians stranded in the United Arab Emirates due to the coronavirus pandemic have returned home. This brings the number of evacuees from the UAE to a total of 2,042. The Nigerians in Diaspora Commission say the evacuees who arrived at the Namdi Azikwe International Airport this afternoon all tested negative for COVID-19 before departure. They're expected to self-isolate for 14 days in line with the protocol of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 and the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. They're also expected to take another COVID-19 test before rejoining society. And staying with COVID-19-related stories, music artist 
Aziz Fashola, also known as Naira Mali, has been fined 200,000 Naira by Napuja Mobile Court for violating COVID-19 protocol on the 13th of June 2020. He pleaded guilty to the four-count charge filed against him by the FCT administration for hosting a concert in Abuja in clear violation of COVID-19 protocol and is expected to publish a public apology in any national newspaper. The concert at Jabi Lake Mall elicited public outcry with many who attended breaking protocol at the peak of the coronavirus pandemic in the country. Naira Mali is said to have flown in a chartered plane meant for a Lagos judge to the Federal Capital Territory for a concert on Saturday, July 13th. To legal matters, a Kaduna State High Court sitting in Kaduna State has fixed September the 29th to rule on the no-case submission filed by the leader of Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zagzaki. The IMN leader is asking the court to quash the state government's case against him for lack of evidence. Counsel to the defendant, Abu Bakr Marshall, who held briefs for the lead counsel, Mr. Femi Falano, asked the courts to quash the charges prefer preferred against El Zagzaki by the government for not disclosing an offence known to law contrary to Section 36, Subsection 8 and Subsection 2 of the 1999 Constitution as amended. The prosecution counsel, Dari Bayero, adopted his final arguments in the matter. The IMN leader and his wife, Zainat, are standing trial on allegations of culpable homicide, unlawful assembly and disruption of public peace, amongst other charges. The chairman of the Northeast Development Commission, retired Major General Paul Tafa, says those accusing the Commission of Corruption are merely out to distract the agency from achieving its objectives, which is that of rebuilding the Northeast that has been destroyed by Boko Haram. He insists that the Commission is managed by men and women of integrity who have earned the trust of President Buhari and will not be distracted by what he describes as an attempt to smear the reputation of those managing the affairs of the NEDC. General Paul Tafa was speaking to journalists on the sideline of the inauguration of a six billion naira Northeast Development Education Endowment Trust Fund in Abuja. The board consists of men of caliber, men of integrity, men of substance. All those people who are trying to make headline out of nothing doesn't bother us at all. We're not going to be truncated by people saying this and that. We have objectives. After all, how long are we as a commission? Hmm? You begin to blame a child of one year for not knowing how to read and write. But with the experience behind us and with the focus we have and with the trust that the, the president has in us, we are going to achieve all things. And we are not bothered about what people say just to smear the name of individuals or the commission. We have an objective. So whatever they say in the papers, headline, that doesn't disturb us at all. The most important thing is for us to be focused on what objectives we have ahead of us. From Northeast Development to Corporate Governance, the Institute of Directors has launched the 2020 Ethics Code aimed at improving corporate governance in public and the private sector. The document covers areas of topical ethics issues including conflict of interest, gifts and hospitality, and whistleblowing. The participants at the hybrid virtual event were drawn from the public and private sector and are expected to adopt these ethics in their everyday operations. This hall looks empty, but it doesn't diminish the importance of the issues at stake here. Ethics within the public and private sector. The Institute of Directors Nigeria is not taking this matter lightly, so he put together a team to develop a code of ethics because poor corporate governance, corruption and the unethical practices affect everyone. It is an aspirational code and therefore applicable in general to all other institutions government bodies and entities that would like to enshrine good corporate governance and business ethics. It is therefore expected that it is a body that continuously advocates best practices and standards in governance 
the members of our institute should be role models and standards in ethical practices. If you practice the right... The launch event was chaired by Dr. Christopher Collade and had in attendance the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Adeni Adebayo, members of the Institute of Directors Nigeria and captains of industries and other guests. It is reassuring to know that the Institute of Directors Code of Ethics 2020 clearly lays out the values and principles that should guide the directors in order to preserve and improve public confidence so, the keynote speaker focused on the reasons why the Code of Ethics should be taken very seriously uh, and should be about influencing behavior for good. For next... So good ethics is about long-term uh, sustainability, not just the next sales or the next revenues, but the long-term perspective. The panel comprised a financial institution, a regulator, and an anti-graft agency, and was moderated by the chief executive officer of the Ethics Institute, South Africa. They all agree that implementing ethical standards has to be wholesome. Um, ethical culture does not fall out of thin air. It is something that must be deliberately cultivated, and boards have a very special um, responsibility to govern the ethics of organizations. Every single individual in an organization is responsible. And before a market can develop, it's important that there are effective practices in organizations um, within um, the market. It's like a reminder of what the holy books say that people ignore and then they are extracted and put into uh, business documents. The Institute of Directors Nigeria says its reviewed Code of Ethics 2020 has been designed to guide members and the public to showcase the impact of poor governance practices on institutions. Nao Taibe, Channels Television News. Residents of Lagos may have to brace up for some tough times next week as the national leadership of the Nigeria Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas Workers, Nupeng, has directed petroleum tanker drivers to withdraw their services with effect from Monday. Nupeng says the directive follows the failure of various authorities in the state to address three major issues that have severely caused petroleum tanker drivers' pain and harrowing experiences in the state for several months now. According to the union, the three major issues are the extortion of money from petroleum tanker drivers by various security agents, the menace of containerized trucks at Apapa, Kirikiri and Beachland Axis of Lagos, and collusion of government officials hindering petroleum tankers from loading activities at depots and tank farms, harassment and extortion by area boys and area godfathers. Nupeng says the petroleum tankers will not return to work until the Lagos state government and other relevant stakeholders address their critical challenges. When the news at 10 returns, President Muhammadu Buhari signs the amended companies and the law light Matches Bill 2020, Allied Matters Bill 2020 into law 30 years after its first enactment. That's on Business News. Do join us again. Welcome back. Rain Oil Limited, a leading integrated company operating in the downstream sector of the Nigerian oil and gas industry, has launched its liquefied petroleum gas LPG facility at Ijegu in Lagos. Commissioning the multi-million Naira facility, the Minister of State for Petroleum, Timi Priye Silva, and the GMD and NPC, Malam Melekiari, says rain oil and gas will help the country achieve the penetration of domestic gas. The joint visit of the Minister of State for Petroleum, Tim Priya Silva, the Group Managing Director, NMPC, Malia Kiari, and top executives of the corporation, industry players, to the outskirts of Ijegu and Lagos, must be something that strikes a chord of industry relevance. The energy sector is going green, and Rain Oil Limited has stepped up to the plate with the launch of this liquefied petroleum gas LPG facility with a tank capacity of 8,000 metric tons and a fleet capacity of about 40 LPG trucks to aid distribution of the product. Facility, ladies, facility that we commissioned here today bring prosperity. 
we operate a fleet of more than 90 retail stations across the country, across 18 states in this country. We have a fleet of more than 100 tank trucks with which we distribute petroleum products across the country. We also own a ship with which we import products into this country. So rain oil is very well represented in the entire value chain from shipping to storage to distribution to retailing to continually profess solutions to bridge gaps in the energy sector. Rain Oil says this multi-facility LPG business, which will now trade as rain oil gas, invariably aligns with that in-country utilization and deepening of gas penetration. And to deepen the penetration of gas, uh, LPG use uh, in, 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 in the country. So this is actually the best time to have this investment and I believe that rain oil has, seen, has a lot of foresight in uh, making this investment at this time because the future is very bright for gas development in Nigeria. Management says it already accounts for 16.6% of the LPG storage in the country and we continue to invest in the value chain in making gas a preferred fuel in the country. We at the NMPC are doing everything possible to pull the fiscal infrastructure from the upstream all the way through the midstream into homes and, and businesses. And you can also achieve this alone, so you have to bring partners, you have to see stakeholders like Rain Oil to take position, build assets so that we can deepen the use of LPG in the market. Nigeria is said to be the fastest growing LPG sector in the world, with a projected LPG market size of $10 billion, which will require $6 billion worth of investment. Rain Oil says they will stand to be counted to realizing those targets. To housing, an ultra-modern housing estate will soon be developed at the site of the old Abakwa market in Abakaliki in Ebony State. Special assistant to the Governor on Food and Vegetable Market Development in the capital city, Emmanuel Uzo, says the government that the old market is being demolished because it was not rightly situated in the first place and did not conform to the master plan of the capital city. He says that the affected traders will be relocated to an international market, which is already in place. These used to be old Abakwa market in Nabakaliki. Now it's only a pile of stones. The Aboy State government is responsible for this and with good reason too. The government commends the demolition of the markets because of its plans to build an ultra-modern housing estate. We have come up with uh, ways of handling it. Some of the buildings that pass integrity tests that are privately owned, we are going to uh, allow them, but the owners are going to remodel it to fall into our master plan. But some of them that uh, failed integrity tests, we are going to demolish them. This is not the only reason the market is coming down. Security is another. Based on the, the nature of the place, there are some hoodlums will be using there as a hideout in the night, more especially. And then uh, it wasn't all that that was said. I believe very strongly it wasn't as serious as people were, were rumoring it, because we used to keep security men right around this place. And then, uh, you know, it has not taken up to four months they relocated from here. As such, it couldn't have been so such. But some people who were using some of the doors were also coming in these guys of criminals. So they will come and pee the doors. But I believe very strongly the, the matter is put to rest. Now that it's being demolished, nobody will use it. Usually, demolitions like this cause an opera from residents. But this is different. The state's government's action has received a lot of commendation from the people. This is why. I've been even, I've even complaining, say, uh, one day this will, could loss will be to, uh, the stop in here. But I'm happy seeing him doing this thing today. I'm very happy. The government is doing well to demolish the place if they will attract something like uh, uh, industry for here so that uh, people of Ebony will benefit. The Ebony state government says it has a plan to make Ebony a mega city. And according to the government, bringing down this market and building an ultra-modern housing estate is for the greater good of the state.
And now to the health sector. The Nigerian Medical Association in Enugu State is asking the national body of the association to intervene in the crisis rocking the state chapter following a violent election yesterday. The process to elect new executives of the association turned bloody yesterday at the Michael Okwara Square when aggrieved members of the association, a block of Association of Resident Doctors Park Lane, stormed the venue demanding total cancellation of the process alleging disenfranchisement and marginalization by the executive whose tenure is expected to end on August the 22nd. Both members of the executives and the aggrieved resident doctors in Enugu State University Teaching Hospital believe a quick intervention by the national body is what is needed to get past the crisis state. And to bring us up to speed on the world of business, here is Tenyola Shobowali. Thanks, Olumide. Welcome to Business News. President Mohamedou Buhari has signed the amended Companies and Allied Matters Bill 2020 into law, following its recent passing by the National Assembly. This is coming 30 years after the first act was established under military president Brahim Babangida to boost economic programs and liberalize the financial market and economy for the private sector. With the signing by the president, the new CAMA Act, which now replaces the Companies and Allied Matters Act introduced in 1990 is expected to bring significant improvement in turnaround time for potential promoters of companies in Nigeria and improve the ease of registering new businesses in the country. The review of the CAMA Act has been under legislative review many years without success after an initial review in 2004 following dynamic changes within various sectors of Nigeria's economy. Meanwhile, the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, has been speaking of ways the federal government plans to revive the economy amid the COVID-19 pandemic and shortfall in revenue from crude oil. At the 2020 Presidential Policy Dialogue organized by the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Vice President notes that the government is aware of the challenges facing businesses in the country. He also assured that the Economic Sustainability Plan of the current administration will address majority of the problems. Nigeria, just like the rest of the world, is battling with the effect of the coronavirus, coupled with the fall in oil prices that has seen a huge drop in government revenue. Part of the ways identified by the federal government to shore up revenue is to diversify the economy and address major bottlenecks faced by big and small industries in the country. But this can only be done through public-private partnership. It's for this reason that the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry has organized the Presidential Policy Dialogue to engage the government on policy issues geared towards economic diversification. We should all do what we can to attract private capital from the domestic economy and the global investing community. We are aware that there are huge financial gaps, especially in infrastructure delivery. The challenges of funding in the economy and the operations of government is a major concern. On hand to address concerns raised, uh, Vice President pass. Professor Yemi Oshibaju gives first-hand details of what the federal government is doing to improve business environment in the country. You would already be familiar with the details of the uh, economic sustainability plan. In essence, it's intended to boost production, prevent business collapse, and provide liquidity. It will also promote the use of labor-intensive methods and direct um, labor interventions in key areas like agriculture, light manufacturing, housing construction, uh, and facility maintenance, while increasing infrastructural investments in roads, in bridges, in solar power, and communications technologies. Buttressing the points raised by Professor Oshibaju, the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Adeni Adebayo, lists the achievement of all the economic committees set up by the federal government. It is important to state that PEBEC, through its secretariat and collaboration with the private sector, has successfully implemented over 150 reforms to make business easier for micro, small and medium enterprises, which account for 90% of registered businesses in Nigeria and contribute nearly 50% of the country's gross domestic product, GDP. It's believed that consultative engagement such as this 
is key towards achieving the much-desired economic sustainability growth. To the NSC now, the first trading week of August ends in the positive after investors maintain bargain hunting activity in the entire five trading sessions. Chimizi Obiwagu has the details. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Stock Market Report. Trading at the equities market has been quite exciting for traders this week and there seemed to be some kind of renewed confidence. Wondering the reason behind that? It's simply because the earnings we have seen so far were better than expected despite the effect of COVID-19 pandemic. So investors are repositioning while those who were considering to sell before and now having a rethink, they will rather hold their shares and watch. Of course, today is not different from what we've seen since the beginning of the week. The bulls are still in charge, pushing the all-share index further up, 0.45% into the green. It's also green all the way for the sectors, but banking stocks were the pretty brides. Look at the sector performance, 2.38% up. GT Bank, Zenit, Axis and Stambic IBTC are expected to churn in their audited half-year results. And guess what? Investors have an eye on the interim dividends expected to be paid. Activity is still not impressive. Volume and value may be low, but outlook is promising. However, foreign portfolio investors are yet to make a comeback. Hopefully, the bulls will maintain their shine on the market in the coming week. And that was the Stock Market Report. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. And that's business news tonight. It's back to you, Olumide. Thank you, Taniola. And now to aviation, where the Asaba International Airport in Delta is set to resume flight operations several months after it was shut down due to the coronavirus pandemic, which paralyzed business and socioeconomic activities across the globe. Secretary to the Delta State Government, Mr. Chedu Ebiye, said he is optimistic that the inspection team of the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority will give its approval for the resumption of operations at the airport going by the level of preparations made in, to ensure strict adherence to the COVID-19 safety protocols. You can, you can Empty ticketing counters and runway, a clear indication that flight operations have not started at the Asaba airport. Just like other airports across the country, Operations at this airport were also shut down by the federal government as a measure to contain the spread of the coronavirus. As the government begins to ease the lockdown across the country, various airports were given a nod to begin operations, but Asaba is yet to get the green light. Here is a team led by the Secretary to the State Government, Chiedu Ebiye, to ascertain the level of preparedness of the management of the airport for full resumption of flight operations at the airport. Meanwhile, there are evidences that some level of work have been done to ensure physical distancing and hand hygiene are maintained by passengers and workers at the airport. In terms of um, the reopening, we've worked very hard to ensure that um, all of these things have, put, have been put together within the shortest possible time. We've also stayed um, in very close contact with um, the management of NCA and we hope that within, probably between now and um, very early next week, uh, the airport should be to be reopened to commercial operations. Staff of the airport are also undergoing training to enable them function optimally in line with the new normal. We have taught them the proper hand washing, how to wear the mask, how to disinfect their working environment, how to wear the face mask properly, and other things they need to know. We have told them that all these things has to be a culture and a tradition that has to continue for the time being, as far as COVID-19 is still with us. It's a very important move. With what we've learned here so far, it will be very easy for us to curtail and curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. With all of these put in place, the state government believes the airport is good to go with flight operations, as it awaits confirmation from the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. Still ahead on the news at 10, at least 16 people killed and dozens injured as here in the India Express plane crashes. Plus, more stories from our London studio and around the world in five. Please stay with us.
Watch Channels Television on DSTV Channel 420. Channels Television is now on DSTV Channel 420. Welcome back. At least 16 people have been killed and dozens injured as an Air India Express plane with 191 people on board crashed at an airport in the southern state of Kerala. India's Aviation Authority says the aircraft, en route from Dubai, skidded off the runway and broke in two at Calicut Airport upon landing. The Prime Minister Narendra Modi says he is pained by the unfortunate accident. The plane was repatriating Indians stranded by the coronavirus pandemic. For other international stories, let's join Simon Pusey in our London studios for Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Lebanese security forces have fired tear gas at demonstrators in Beirut as anger following the massive explosion on Tuesday grows. Security forces confronted dozens of anti-government protesters, with many of them reportedly being wounded. Protesters gathered near Parliament where a small fire was lit and stones were thrown at officers. Shock has turned to anger in the city, where at least 154 people died and more than 5,000 were injured in the explosion, when a huge pile of ammonium nitrate abandoned in a warehouse in the port caught fire. Volunteers continue to arrive from across Lebanon and abroad to clear rubble and debris from the streets and neighborhoods surrounding the explosion. U.S. President Donald Trump has issued two executive orders that would ban any transaction with the Chinese companies that own TikTok and WeChat. The president argued the U.S. must take aggressive action in the interests of national security. TikTok has come under fire from U.S. lawmakers and the Trump administration over national security concerns. TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, faces a deadline of September the 15th, either to sell its U.S. operations to Microsoft or another U.S. firm, or face an outright ban. Australia is preparing for further domestic border closures as Victoria State has announced another daily record high for the number of COVID-19 infections. Officials in Queensland State announced they would close the state's border with New South Wales, the second worst hit state. This triggered a large number of vehicles queuing to cross the border into Queensland. Meanwhile in the US, a new model from the University of Washington projects the country's death toll from the virus to climb to nearly 300,000 people by December. The US has the most deaths in the world at almost 160,000 with 4.8 million known cases. And Peru has surpassed 20,000 deaths with the nation's healthcare system struggling to keep up. Bodies have been seen outside hospitals in some of the main regional cities near the capital Lima as the country becomes the third most hit by the virus in Central and Southern America. Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksa and his party have won an overwhelming two-thirds majority in a parliamentary election, giving him the power to enact sweeping changes to the constitution. The re-elected president had sought a two-thirds majority in parliament to be able to restore full executive powers to the presidency, which he says are necessary to implement his agenda to make the country economically and militarily secure. In Belarus, President Alexander Lukashenko, who's been in power for 26 years, is facing an unprecedented opposition in Sunday's election from a political political novice who says she only wants a clean vote. Thousands of opposition supporters clapped, cheered and chanted at a rally in the capital Minsk, defying a crackdown by the government ahead of the elections. Mr Lukashenko earlier announced that a number of US nationals had been detained but did not say when or why. Thousands of South Korean trainee doctors have gone on strike in Seoul to protest against a government plant to boost the number of medical students in the country. The government argues this will be necessary to fight emergencies like the coronavirus pandemic. However, protesters argue this would be a poor use of additional funding for the sector, saying they would be better spent improving the salaries of existing trainees, which would encourage them to move out of Seoul to rural areas. Ivory Coast President Alassane Utara has announced he will seek re-election in October, defying opponents who say the constitution forbids him from running again. 
The incumbent president has announced in March he would not be seeking a third term, but the leading party asked him to reconsider after his preferred successor, Amadou Gong Koulibaly, died in July. The first round of polling will be held on October 31st. Authorities in Mauritius have warned of an oil spill along its southeastern coast following a breach in a Panama-flagged ship carrying oil and diesel. Some experts were already calling the spill a disaster, with major risks to the environment. The large bulk carrier was carrying 200 tonnes of diesel and 3,800 tonnes of heavy oil. The leader of a Mexico-based church has been ordered to pay $90 million, nearly double his original bail, on newly expanded charges of rape, human trafficking and child pornography. The ruling virtually assures that the 51-year-old Nason Joachim Garcia will remain in custody as he awaits trial. Garcia and the church deny any wrongdoing. And finally, with temperatures in London hitting 36 degrees, animals in the capital's main zoo were given icy treats to help them keep cool in the hot weather. The zoo's Asiatic lion pride were first up and offered an iced breakfast banquet of frozen horsehide to celebrate the upcoming World Lion Day, which will be marked on Monday. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Simon, thank you. And now it's time for sports news. Here's Ayotunde Balogun. Many thanks, Olumide. The Federal Ministry of Youth and Sports Development has confirmed the resumption of non-contact sports following the lifting of the ban by the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. The non-contact sports are tennis, table tennis, squash, badminton, cycling, athletics, golf, polo, para-athletics and cricket. The Minister, Mr. Sondidari, thanked the Presidency for the decision and insists that the listed sports federations must obey the COVID-19 health and safety protocols. In football, Olympic Lyon and Manchester City have advanced to the quarterfinal stage of this season's UEFA Champions League. Lyon pulled off the biggest upset in the round of 16 despite losing 2-1 to Juventus. In the game, Cristiano Ronaldo scored a brace but qualified 2-2 on aggregate based on the away goals rule. Elsewhere, Man City also progressed after beating Spanish champions Real Madrid 2-1 with goals from Raheem Sterling and Gabriel Jesus at the 80 had to qualify for the next round 4-2 on aggregate. The league management company LMC has informed participating clubs in the Nigeria Professional Football League about the need to fully comply with licensing regulations and financial controls for the 2020-21 season. The LMC asked the clubs to use the football shutdown period to carry out necessary activities such as upgrade of stadium facilities and familiarization of other criteria as provided in the regulations. The league governing body said on-the-spot checks will be carried out and any airing clubs will be barred from participating in the top flight. A Dutch football club, Feyenoord Rotterdam, have confirmed that former international striker Robin van Persie will join their coaching team. A Feyenoord Rotterdam said the former Arsenal and Man United star has agreed to work alongside Dick Advocaat in a coaching capacity. And that's Sports News. Thank you, Ayo. And the main news again. President Mohamed Buhari today endorsed the candidate of the APC, Pastor Sagi Zeyamu, ahead of next month's Edo State Governorship election. The president handed the party's flag to Mr. Yamu. Also today, Governor Godwin Obasaki rejected the purported takeover of Edo State House of Assembly by 17 lawmakers. Meanwhile, some market women also gathered at the assembly complex to rally support for Governor Obasaki's re-election. And at least 16 persons were confirmed killed today as the Air India Express plane crash landed at an airport in Kerala. That's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alumni McCauley.